What about the idea that to be a scientist, particularly to be a world-class scientist such as you are, there's a genius within you. This idea which you're either born with or you're not. I'm not sure I completely buy that. I think that a scientist needs to have something inborn, but they also have to acquire ways of thinking from experience of the whole world. And sometimes you can acquire what I call a low cunning in research. You, you sort of get used to how nature tries to fool you, or perhaps how you try to fool yourself. And there is over the years a sort of maturing of your thinking that comes with experience, comes with interacting with others. So I think it's both inborn, but also something you acquire and something that you gain from interaction experience with the rest of the research community. Were you an outstanding, brilliant student at school? Not really, if I can be quite honest with you. My father um, worked in a factory for H.J. Hines, actually, looked after machines. My mother was a, was a cleaner, and um, so it wasn't a very academic background. But they were very supportive of me at school. I was the only one in my family to stay at school beyond the age of 15. I wasn't good at exams. Um, I was very um, erratic. So sometimes I could be near the top or even the top of my class. Next time I could be near the bottom. It just, I just didn't seem to be very consistent. But I got through it. <laughs> I did manage to eventually get to university. Even that was actually quite difficult. And as I gradually moved up the tree, so to speak, it became easier and easier because we didn't rely so much on rote learning. I've got a terrible memory, you can never remember things. It did rely on trying to understand very difficult problems and um, that I wasn't bad at. What I wasn't good at was remembering all the bits of information that you needed to um, pass exams well. Well, for example, in at or near beginning chemistry, could you memorize the elements table? I, of course, was supposed to but I kept getting it wrong. But when I understood what the table was based on, when I could put order in there and think about electron shells and so on, the whole thing fell into shape. What, what really mattered for me was understanding the basis and the order. Then I could put the names to it. If I was just learning the names with no order, I was hopeless. So you eventually conquered the periodic table. Yes, but you're not going to test me on it now, I hope. No, I'm not qualified to test you. But I eventually conquered it <laughs> primarily by understanding the landscape of the periodic table. I have a feeling that any number of parents and grandparents listening would be very much encouraged <laughs> to find that someone who didn't have a particularly good memory, might have been a poor memory as a matter of fact, and who didn't test well, grew up to win a Nobel Prize. They should feel really comfortable if they have a child or a grandchild who is interested in the world, who is curious about the world, because that will keep going. That will serve them well for the rest of their lives. If they're just learning stuff by rote so they can get good marks, and we have too much of an obsession with grades, they, they will do well even if they may not have the highest marks in their class. And what advice could you give to a parent or grandparents if they have that kind of child? They say, listen, he's smart, but he, he doesn't do well in tests. He sometimes fails these tests and he can't memorize the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I'd take him out into the natural world. I'd show him the plants, the bees, the insects, the birds, the moon, the stars, see if that interests him or her. And if it does, I wouldn't worry. I want to get back now to, to your story. So you go on, you get into university. And by the way, correct me if I'm wrong, you actually never passed what you should have passed to get in in terms of foreign language. No, I, I had great trouble getting into university. I can tell you that story. We, we have um, a series of rather simple examinations. To, you can pass muster in a, a range of subjects. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the more specialist ones. In my case, it was the sciences. I actually did the more specialist advanced ones early in my schooling. I was very good at that. But I could not pass the, all the lower grade examinations that you needed to get into university. And, <laughs> and I managed to fail this examination in French six times on the trot. I mean, six times, one after another. And it wasn't I wasn't trying. I was trying very hard. I was simply hopeless at it. Right. And of course, that meant I was rejected from every university I applied to. No Oxford, no Cambridge. No, either. Cambridge offered me a place as long as I passed that exam, for example, which I continued to fail. And then eventually, I got into the University of Birmingham. Good university, but not the top school. 
And the reason I did, the professor, the head of department, was looking through the candidates that they had rejected. What on earth was he doing doing that? But he was looking through the candidates they'd rejected. He saw my CV, he saw I'd done well in the serious examinations and why I'd been rejected. And he asked me to come up and see him and he spent the day with me, a head of department, with this 17-year-old. At the end of it, he said, um, if you come here, I'll fix the university senate so they let you in. And that's exactly what he did. Well, it's a tough word, but in effect, he cheated to get you in college. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> I want to get back to the, to the students, the young people coming up. Listen, you, you can educate, you can illuminate. How do you inspire? What, imagine for me a moment a six-year-old or eight or nine-year-old, can you say anything that you think might inspire them to at least have a something more than a passing interest mm. in science? Inspiration is key. We have to inspire, actually our population, but particularly our young people. Our teaching has to inspire. And uh, when I go to lectures sometimes, and I listen to somebody who's very accomplished, and they're so flat, so non-inspirational. I think, what are we doing? We write scientific papers now. I can't even bear to read my own scientific papers. I mean, there's nothing inspirational about them at all by the way that we have to publish and we get edited out and saying anything interesting and so on. I find it more interesting to read the 19th century literature about science because we are losing the ability to inspire by the way that we're communicating science. Getting back to the question you asked me, it's crucial to have good, inspirational teachers in school. We absolutely need it. The fact that in primary school children, and that is up to uh, the age of 11, I think in both the US and UK, less than one or two percent of teachers have any scientific training. I mean, that cannot be right. And then we have to train teachers to be inspirational. Now, how can they be inspirational? One part is actually to teach science through doing science through investigating the world. A second is, of course, simply to have inspirational and charismatic teachers. What would I say to a seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old is what inspired me. Go and look at the moon at night. Go and look at the stars and wonder. And wonder what it all means, and you're already on the first step to science. And what we have to do in education is to take that natural wonder that children have and develop it into understanding how all of that works.